G'day everyone, my name is Jeff, and in this video I'm going to be talking about the Nikon Z6 and some of the issues I've had uh, with this camera integrating it into my real estate photography workflow. Now for the last three years I've been using this setup here, which is the Nikon D750 and the 14-24 f2.8 lens. Now the Nikon D750 has been an excellent body for my real estate photography work. I find that the dynamic range of the sensor and just the quality of the image I get out of this um, is excellent for what I do. The 14-24mm lens is an excellent range as well and the images are sharp and clear and I love this lens and camera body combination. Now there's a few small things that I uh, love about the D750 that I didn't realize how much I loved until I got my Nikon Z6 here. And the reason for that is just basically that the D750 body and a lot of Nikon's DSLR bodies uh, just tend to have more buttons for dedicated functions than a smaller mirrorless camera does. So I'm going to go through a few of those now and just talk about those things which I miss on the Nikon Z6 compared to my Nikon D750. Now the first issue I've had with the Z6 for my real estate photography is a lack of a dedicated bracketing button. Now on the D750, which I've used for three years now, and my D810, there's dedicated bracketing buttons. And the dedicated bracketing button is basically on the side of the body below the pop-up flash and it's a mechanical button. So whenever you need to bracket, which for a real estate photographer I do pretty much in every single job, I can press that button in and adjust my bracketing and it's done. Uh, I don't have to dig into menus like I used to when I was using Canon. And also if I turn the camera on and off, it stays in bracketing mode, which is handy for me as well. Now every now and then I will turn it on and I'll shoot and it's in bracketing mode and I'm like, oh, I didn't want it bracketing mode. That doesn't really bother me too much. I actually like the fact that it stays on when you turn the camera on and off. Now the Nikon Z6 doesn't have a bracketing button and it's pretty obvious why. I guess it's just because it's such a smaller body. There's really uh, not a lot of room for buttons and Nikon has decided that they're going to drop a few of the uh, dedicated buttons, one of them being the bracketing. Now this was an easy fix, so not a real big issue to be honest. Uh, all I've done with the Z6 is I've just changed the custom button layout. So on the front of the camera you have a function one and function two button next to the lens, or next to the lens barrel. And I've literally just changed my function two button to be bracketing. So now when I press my function two button, I can adjust my bracketing with my two dials at the back of the camera. The back dial obviously adjusts the number of frames and the front dial adjusts the gap between the frames. So easy fix for that one. Not that really, not that big a deal really, to be honest, um, because you know, you, you got these custom buttons anyway. I've left the top custom button to white balance, which I do change from time to time, and my bottom custom button is bracketing. And I've honestly gotten pretty used to that fairly quickly. So not a big loss for that one but still a difference between the two bodies. Now the next issue that I've found between the D750 and the Z6 is a little bit different um, and that issue is the drive mode. So on the Nikon D750 and on, on a lot of their DSLRs, they have a dedicated drive mode ring which is basically underneath the mode dial and there's a button there and you can turn the ring and you can change it from single, continuous, quiet mode and you can set it into timer mode, which is very handy. Then to change the length of the timer, you've got to go into the uh, menu system and you can change the length of the timer from 2 seconds, 5, 10, 20, etc. Now having a dedicated drive ring, a mechanical drive ring which you lock in place, for me is ideal and it's pretty much nearly essential. Uh, as a real estate photographer, I'm shooting all my photography on the tripod. I'm shooting at high apertures with low shutter speeds, so I'm or slow shutter speeds, that is. So I need to have some kind of timer or remote control. Now, I don't like working with remote controls. I just don't like that extra piece of equipment hanging off the side of the camera. I, and it's just too fiddly to deal with. So I prefer to use the timer release. 
Now on the D750, it was never an issue to use timer release. I simply left it in timer mode all the time and it was always on two second timer. So whenever I turned the camera on, it was on two second timer. Now every now and then, I would get up on a ladder and go to shoot a bracketed set of frames at the front of a house and nothing would happen. Oh, it's still in timer mode, I forget. So I'd change it to um, you know, high, high speed continuous and I'd shoot my bracketed shots of the front of the house up a ladder and then I'd get back down and then switch it straight back into timer mode again. That's fantastic. And having a mechanical button there which locks it on is perfect for what I do. So with the Z6, Obviously, they don't have a mechanical drive mode dial like they do on the D750 or the D810. So what Nikon's done instead is they've put a button on the back of the camera for the drive mode, which is just below the menu. Now, if you press that button down, you can change your drive mode by swinging the back, the back dial, and the back dial changes it. I can put on two seconds, and the front dial can actually change it to 5, 10, or 20. And now that is actually really handy. It's handy that I can actually change the speed or the duration of my timer now without having to dig through a menu. I can just use a front dial. That's actually very handy to have. Now the problem though is not necessarily that it's now a button function on the back because I can set that. I can set that to two second timer and that will be on two second timer or five or 10 or 20, no problem. And I'll be shooting away my job and timer's working fine, but then I set my tripod up in the doorway of a bathroom or bedroom and I look over and realize I have to fix the doona or I have to fix the pillows or some cushions or a chair or remove a bin. So I walk into the room and I do all those things. I clean up the bed, I adjust the pillows a bit, I remove a rubbish bin uh, or you know whatever it is, whatever I have to clean up in that room, I get in there and I do that and I come back, sight my shot, adjust the camera a bit more, trust my uh, head, left, right, up and down, get it all perfect, just where I want, go to press the button, and two second time is not on anymore. And the reason why is because the camera times out, it has a timeout function, so after uh, a minute on default, I think it is, the Z6 will obviously time out to save power. Now it's a power saving function. And you want a power saving function on a mirrorless camera because you're constantly using that sensor to give you a readout through your LCD on the back, which is battery draining. With the D750, I can turn the, the uh, live view on and off at will. So if I was going off for a couple of minutes to fix things up, I actually used to turn the live view off to conserve battery power. You can't turn live view off of a mirrorless camera, obviously, it's always on. So you need to use that timer mode in order to save draining your battery. Now, when the timer times out like I just did, and I put my camera back on and go to shoot, guess what? My drive mode has reset back to single shot from timer. That is really frustrating and really annoying. Now, I've dug through the menus and I've looked for a solution to this, and I cannot find how to keep the release mode on two second timer, or on any timer for that matter. The funny thing is though, if I change that release mode to say, for instance, continuous high, continuous low, and it times out, it'll stay on continuous high or continuous low. But if it goes on to timer mode, the self timer, when the camera times out for power saving mode and comes back on, when I trigger the, the uh, button again, it's reset back to single shot. And I find myself getting back to my camera and having to constantly put it back onto two second timer mode, which drives me up the wall. I use two second timer for pretty much every interior shot I do. So that is really frustrating and that's an issue I'm gonna bring up with Nikon and ask them if they can change that in a firmware update that will allow the two second timer to stay on when the camera times out. Now, I know you can adjust the, the actual timeout mode of the camera, the power saving function, and I could set that to 10 minutes or whatever and it would never time out. I get that. But for me, I need to conserve battery power as well. And I want that I want that timeout mode to kick in after a minute because I don't want to drain my batteries when I'm on uh, a constant job after job after job during a day. Uh, I just don't want to go through a, a slurry of batteries. But now I've got the batteries. I can always just do that, buy more batteries and just deal with the fact that it's going to run out of battery power quicker because I've got the, uh, the um, power saving mode turned off. 
So that's an issue between the two cameras. That's something I really loved about the D750 that's lacking or has fallen short on the Z6. Now the next issue I wanna talk about is something which I didn't expect I would find useful on the D750, but when I started using the Z6 and realized it didn't do the same as the, Z, as the D750, I realized how useful that little feature was. And it's not really a feature as such, but there is a little quirk with the D750 and the D810 for that matter. And that quirk is that if you trigger the shutter, you can still adjust your shutter speed or aperture while the timer's on. So if you uh, trigger your shutter and look down and realize that your shutter speed is wrong, you can quickly adjust it. So I can trigger, quickly adjust, and I can adjust my shutter speed after I've triggered the shot. Now, it's not, like I said, it's not really a feature that I think Nikon deliberately incorporated into their cameras. It's just one of those little quirks of a Nikon camera itself. But it's something I really loved about my D750 because every now and then, you would, um, you would shoot a shot for an interior and say you'd be on uh, two seconds and you'd shoot two seconds and you get your shot and the next shot you want to shoot under and you go again but you trigger it before you change it and you could quickly change that shutter speed if you accidentally triggered the camera before you changed it. Now granted you, you're at risk there obviously of shaking or introducing a bit of camera shake but I actually found that a little bit handy that I could just do that every now and then. With the Z6 or the Z6, I should say. Uh, once you trigger the camera, actually I'll put it on timer mode, so I'll put my Z6 on timer mode, on self timer, and once I trigger that self timer, I'm locked out of my control dials altogether. Um, this is not a huge issue, it's just one of those little quirky things about the D750 and the D810, which I actually liked. I actually didn't mind the fact that I could make a, a fine adjustment to my shutter or aperture after I triggered the timer. And when you had it on two or five second timer, that was actually quite handy. You could, I, could, I got into the knack of being able to change one stop in my shutter speed, even if I triggered the two second timer and not get any camera shake. So not really that hugely important, but one of those little quirky things that I loved about the D750 that just isn't on the Z6. I just wanna say a heartfelt thank you to all my subscribers. Thank you for subscribing to my channel and watching my videos and following. Thank you for your questions and comments as well. I've run my own business full time since 2007 and I photographed my first real estate property way back in 2005. So for me, it's been a long time. It's been 14 years now since my first real estate photography job. Over the years, you know, I've worked for dozens of agents and I've done hundreds, if not thousands of jobs. And I've seen almost every property you can imagine. Uh, and over the years, I've experienced the ups and downs of this industry and this business in every way, shape and form. I'm currently putting together some educational content, which I'll be offering on my website. And if that's something that interests you, then you can go up to my website and sign up for email notifications of when that content will be available. Again, thank you to everyone who subscribed and watched my videos, and I'll see you in the next one.